Your Majesty, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, what even the great philosopher Plato failed to build, the Dutch have been able to maintain and to create up to these days, namely a completely independent think tank, the Scientific Council for Government Policy, that has been able to provide the different branches of government with topical advices while remaining simultaneously part of a machinery of a state and yet able to draw as much as possible from the powers of thought, philosophy in action, philosophy for action. If it's true that the nature of what is the state and what it is to gain knowledge have always been connected, we should welcome the occasion provided by the anniversary this afternoon of this carefully crafted institution to revisit the very notion of what is a think tank. We often metaphorically say that states have heads, but we rarely inquire what sort of cognitive equipment they should be endowed with, not to mention the neurophysiology of those artificial brains. This is why, to honor this thought reservoir, I choose to treat the question of the sort of thinking the state is supposed to possess. There is some irony, unwanted, I hope, in having invited a Frenchman to participate in this celebration, since not only France never was able to fulfill such a platonic dreams as yours, but she is also the country where the cognitive function of the states are very much in trouble. I won't go as far as saying that I'm speaking to you as a representant of a failed state, but almost. At any rate of a state which has a lot to learn in matter of a cognitive equipment from yours. Fortunately, I'm myself a traitor to my own country, since I'm not only totally Dutchophile, but also a pragmatist philosopher. Pragmatism in this lecture should not be understood as a synonym of worldly or practical, not as the name of a political party, but rather at this attempt made by John Dewey in the 1930 to redesign the tasks of democracy according to a realistic definition of what it is to know something scientifically. As John Dewey said in The Public and Its Problem, a brilliant title for the sort of situation we are in, the state must always be rediscovered. A French pragmatist being a contradictio in terminis. This is why I gather the courage to address you on this serious but also feisty occasion. How can we come about rediscovering the state this afternoon together? First, we should leave aside the idea that the state will wither and become irrelevant through the advent of various transformation coming from the left or from the right. Revolution, communism, market force, internationalism, networks of cities, region, even Europe, or the internet. Contrary to all expectation for its progressive obsolescence, never was the rediscovery of a state more important than today. And we all know the reason. Never was the state so busy, so overburdened than now. Every day, we discover to our great dismay more elements to take into account and to throw into the melting pot of public life instead of less. Not only law and order, not only commerce and war, not only industry and class struggles, not only city life and health, but also, or so it seems, the entire environment, from the quality of the air to the remandering of river, from the quarters of herrings in the North Sea to the slow disappearance of bees and thus of pollinated flowers. And what would be the Netherlands without flowers and without herrings? What the nightmare of the darkest totalitarianism could not even anticipate, but a day would come when the state would have to manipulate the climate itself. The unfortunate, the unprepared, the fragile democratic states of today 
have now to take in charge in addition to the rest. Because of a values ecological crisis, the state is now burdened, it seems, with the destiny of the entire Umwelt. The question of breathing freely in the atmospheres of democracy has become simultaneously a metaphor for freedom and the dire literal reality of climate control, to use a simile from Peter Sloterdijk, a great philosopher who, in spite of having the name of a Dutch train station, is actually German. <laughs> Fortunately for you, of all the nations on earth who are struggling to rediscover how to redesign a state able to provide a breathable space for its citizens through climate control, the Dutch are the more advanced. How fortunate you are, you lower countries, who have known about the ecological crisis at least a good millenary before it came to the public consciousness of other lands, who have known all along that the most important branches of local government were the one in charge of dikes and polders or pumps and mills of floods and meanders, and that there is no distinction to be made between the government of people who could at any point riot and destroy and the government of seas and river, who could at any point overflood and ravage the whole commonwealth. On all these questions of political ecology, the Dutch, for sure, are very much ahead of all the other states. It's in your blood to know, with a very modern type of certainty, that a failed state would immediately mean a flooded land and a disappearing country. The contrast between the good and the bad government this contrast so magnificently painted by Lorenzetti Fresco in the town's hall of Siena is not for the Dutch a matter of metaphor, but is literal indeed. A matter-oriented democracy is also truly for you the little finger that the little boy of a legend put on the dike to make sure it doesn't burst. Is your majesty not also in some really new and very old sense, the queen of an artificial Umwelt, for the fragility and resistance of which you are simultaneously seal, symbol, and warrant. For all this reason, one thing is certain, the state is not about to disappear. Rediscovering the state as what has in charge the whole Umwelt has one second important consequence. We might finally abandon the sterile and useless debates between a type of limited organization of the states and its fully rational alternative, the market. From a pragmatist point of view in the 21st century, the violent struggles over the question of finding an alternative to the state seem as remote as the discussion about the role of sacraments in the golden age in the low countries. It's amazing that such a dispute could have passed for so long as a serious intellectual pursuit. So obvious it is for us now that there is no alternative to the state on condition of rediscovering its realistic cognitive equipment. The problem is to find what sort of knowledge the state is able to gather if we wish to rediscover it. To this search for the cognitive function of science and of a state, I give the name of political epistemology. The idea is simple enough. Every change in our conception of knowledge acquisition instrument must have huge effect on what we can expect from the state to envision and to foresee. And vice versa, every inquiry into the limits of collective action must throw some light on what we may expect from social and natural sciences. This is where John Dewey and his friend Walter Lippmann are so important for us today to rediscover the liberal state. For them, liberalism has never meant the sterile opposition between state organizations and market organizations. How can anyone claim that the market is not anything but a complex bundle of carefully devised and fragile organizations in the plural? It is not state versus market, but organizations, the state itself is not, of course, a single agent, on top of other organizations. True liberalism 
consist in being freed from the visible and from the invisible hands. In other words, the thinking state needs its right and its left hemisphere. We are rather faced with various modes of organization, both at once partially visible, that is, accountable, and partially invisible, that is, unaccountable. Rediscovering the state means replacing the obsolete quarrel between modes of organization with another question altogether. What does it mean for any agent whose action has unforeseen consequences on other agents to be made accountable? Accounts, let me remind you, are intellectual technology that make visible to the collective eyes of a state what it is to envision any state of affair. Why has this mode of organization so often failed, as James Scott has brilliantly shown in his book, Seeing Like a State? For a reason the French know, alas, too well. Because the common good, the public good, was not supposed to be produced by experimental and carefully accountable procedures of inquiries. The public, the common, the disinterested is supposed by nature and once and for all radically different from the private, the commercial, the selfish, the interested. There are people who claim, because they are in position of surveying those accounts, that they know, once and for all, what is the public good, without any additional empirical work of inquiry about the consequences of their remedies. John Dewey's great insight is that, on the contrary, there is nothing more complex, nothing more susceptible of mistakes, nothing in greater need of specific and constantly refreshed inquiry than to detect what, at any point, is the public's problem. I quote, observations of consequences are at least as subject to error and inquiry as is perception of natural object. In this sentence, what is important is the word consequences. Whatever has been planned, there are always unwanted consequences, for a reason that has nothing to do with the quality of the research or with the precision of a plan, but with the very nature of action. It's never the case that you first know and then act. You first act tentatively and then begin to know a bit more before attempting again. It is this groping in the dark that is so difficult to map, especially when it's done by millions of people over the life of millions of others. What has ruined the statist's pretension to rule is not the necessity of the institution itself, but its specific way of devising its cognitive competences, its epistemology, its knowledge of its theory of knowledge acquisition. The state, to paraphrase Lippmann, is not allowed to think properly in a way it can learn anything about what it is to compose the common world. The heads of a state, if I pursue the metaphor, have never been furnished with any realistic knowledge acquisition apparatus. Political epistemology alternates between social engineering, followed when it failed with a sort of cheap version of Machiavellism. The lessons of distributed cognition have never been learned. The multiplication of learning mechanism, on the other hand, has always been the forte of what is passing wrongly for the rational alternative to, to the wasteful folly of a state, namely markets. Naturally, there is nothing especially rational in market devices. But what is so interesting, what is so much lacking in the claims to define the public good, are precisely the devices themselves, what Michel Callon and his colleagues call for that reason calculative devices. What is so great in the calculation of bottom line is not their fame rationality, but the very simple effect of rendering calculable and thus partially accountable what it is to distribute roles, powers, and to allocate resources. It is pure folly 
to imagine a macro rationality that would cover the whole earth and which would calculate the rational outcome of all the goods and services. And please note that this absurdity is just as criminal when it comes from a proponent of a visible hand, a totalitarian state of earth-wide proportion, as it is from a propagandist of the invisible hand, a one-word market. But it would be even more foolish to imagine that we could do without any device to render accountable the exploration of a public good. The liberal of a pragmatist state is not the one that engaged in the absurd attempt of limiting the state. <laughs> the state has no predictable limits known in advance, since the public is always a new problem. But the organization that are able to escape from a totally implausible situation of being deprived of calculating devices, how implausible it would be to imagine that. For the calculation of goods, we would need instruments and devices, but not for the calculation of a public good. How implausible it would be to imagine that. For the allocation of wealth, we would need bottom lines and accounts, but not for the allocation of a commonwealth. The search for the respublica, the public thing, could be done at no cost in equipment, in inquiry, in exploration. But the liberal state is not the only the one freed from the idea of a visible hand without any equipment in calculation. It is also the state freed from the equally silly idea that calculation could replace politics. That's the heart of the matter, the one usually hidden behind the smoke screen of the obsolete debate between state versus market. Accounts help in representing state of affair at time t, not in deciding what to do at time t plus one, nor in predicting what will happen. No calculative device is a substitute for political decisions. What was put inside the thinking heads of state has always alternated between two equally improbable political epistemology. First, the one I mentioned earlier, and so much derided by Lippmann, that you could know the difference between private and public without any inquiry. But second, the equally bizarre cognitive notion that once you had the calculative devices, you could simply calculate the optimum automatically. This idea of an automated calculation is not only wrong when applied to politics, but also to the very history of mathematics. And we could go back to Plato, but I would not. In one case, the head of a thinking state is a know-it-all, deprived of any empirical knowledge. In the other, it's a moron who claims to replace the intelligence of a situation by a mere calculation. In both cases, politics disappear. In one case, when the people doubt its intelligence, the state say, I know what is best because I represent the public good, which is silly because no true, in truth there is no representational tools of any sort. In the other case, when the people doubt the result of a calculation, it answer, no one has calculated. The result of a bottom line is the best possible option, which is equally silly because there is no one to be accountable just at the very moment when you need to accept the really hard political responsibility. True liberalism, pragmatism, is when you are freed from the two injunctions. The state says, and no one knows. The market said, and no one is accountable. To be accountable on the other hand is exactly this, to be able to give an account and to be made responsible for what you conclude from it. Without calculative devices, politics is emptied. Limited to calculation, politics is gutted. To sum up this point, I could say that the state was never allowed to think like a state, but always to think as if it has been struck by a stroke. For this reason, it has always been in need of a region or a tutor of some sort, provided by one science or another. This is why the pragmatist state, in Dewey's sense of the word, 
is so different from the modernist state. The latter also believed in science, but with this crucial difference that one of the science claimed to replace the progressive composition of a common good, my definition of politics. Law, sociology, cybernetics, economic system theory, everything has been attempt to replace its own original thinking by another one that, that would deprive it of a burden, burden of thinking politically like a state. Pragmatism links the cognitive ability of a state not to science capital S, but to research. And as many scientists know too well, this is not the same thing at all. Expertise and research are polar opposite. By contrast, pragmatism wants to have a state be a grown-up at least, and finally furnish with a plausible epistemology of what it is to learn, to think, to provide account and to decide. Pragmatists show the way. You need equipment, that is calculating devices, and it's great that market organizations have invented so many of them, without which there is no way to inquire over what is the public's problem. But then, you can't escape from the burden of being made accountable just at the crucial point when the public is to be composed. At this point, no science will help you. In other words, the whole has to be described, assembled, and compose, not calculated. Such is the difference, I think, that should be made between mere governance, a matter of organization, and politics, a matter of composition. Those who believe that governance will replace politics are the enemies of a liberal state. Nothing can replace politics. This is even more important now than it was between the war when pragmatism had its brief heyday. As I said earlier, the whole has now taken a meaning that neither Lippmann nor Dewey could anticipate. That is, the Umwelt itself, the climate control of the very envelopes of our life. It would be a catastrophe of major proportion if just at the time when the Umwelt is to be granted a political expression, the state was being shrunk to nut and filling into disrepute. Let me remind you, by the way, that uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to the IPPC and not only to Al Gore. And the IPPC is a hybrid, hybrid form if there is uh, any. But it would be just equally catastrophic if because of the ecological crisis, another science this time ecology was to lord over the state and to claim that it again knew how to calculate the common good, that is the natural good, without any interference from politics. The undisputable laws of nature would this time wish politics away, exactly as in the earlier period, the laws of the market claimed to render the state obsolete. Ecology would destroy what economics had not totally obliterated, namely the task of composing the common good and rendering accountable those who do it. To render the cognitive ability of our state experimental or pragmatist is even more important now than even the former nature has been included into the purview of public existence. To put it maybe too bluntly, Politics is always blind, leading blinds. To remind you of this might be a strange and slightly egregious way of celebrating the anniversary of your think tank. But I don't have a feeling that you believe in providing your government with the kind of knowledge that Plato claimed to possess, namely foresight. The cognitive landscape of today is much too different fumbling collectively in the dark through the multiple canals of feeders and sensors reflects more the ways in which a pragmatist state may acquire knowledge today about what is the public and its problem. Which means, of course, a very lively and diverse set of social and natural sciences, a new type of statistical instrument, a free press. But more importantly, 
the building of a core institution of the politics of the future, namely the sites where the whole may be composed instead of simply calculated. What I've invoked many years ago for a metaphor, and this was, by the way, before the IPPC got the Nobel Prize, namely the Parliament of Things, is precisely today the site where nobody is allowed to deprive us of all of the task of defining the we that we form together, which is at the heart of political existence. But there is a last reason why it is so important not to lose the politics of a whole. This time it's not because of the ecological crisis, but because of a claim of a globalizer to already know for sure what is the whole by which they mean, usually, a very narrow provincial idea of what the universal value should be. In every country of Europe, the screams are the same everywhere. We have been abandoned by the state. We are no longer protected. How to doubt that those who scream in such a way are right? Is it not obvious that those who talk about the great winds of globalization, of opening to the world, of taking risk, of abandoning the safe haven of statism and nation, are always blatant hypocrites, safely protected from any risk by golden parachute and fat reservoir stock option on which is written, take no risk ever. Globalizer have a very provincial view of what the whole world is. What they write about is not the global at all, but a lot of globalonies. A state that fails to protect is no longer legitimate. But it doesn't mean that we know what is a state and what sort of protective envelope it should be able to compose. It simply means that the alternative is certainly not between the archaic nationalist attachment to the land and the great winds of a global imperium. Here, too, the state has to be rediscovered. To conclude, I'd venture to say 